Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we will be exploring the future. In fact, we might even say we're exploring the future of the future. With me is futurist Professor Tom Lombardo, who is the author of Future Consciousness, The Path to Purposeful Evolution. He is also the author of The Evolution of Future Consciousness. Another title is Mind Flight, A Journey into the Future. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Jeff. Good to be here. And I should have mentioned you're the director of the Center for Future Consciousness. Correct. Yes. In Glendale, Arizona. In Glendale, Arizona. Thank Good. you. Uh -huh. Good. So, mm. the, the future has been a subject that has occupied your thinking for decades. Yes. Roughly 25 years, unless you count my fascination with science fiction, which then would run back 55 to 60 years. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, it's, it's fascinated me since, um, actually, since I was about 10 or 11 years old, when mm -hmm. I think about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the you know, things that I like about your approach to a topic, a broad topic like the future, mm -hmm. is that one of the first things that you like to do when you get into a, a particular field is find out what other people have said about it and lay out, you know, maybe a dozen different existing approaches so that you can begin to formulate your own with that background. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, when I create created the first course I taught on the future, uh, I did an intensive study <clears throat> of uh, the topic and um, read a lot of different uh, noted uh, writers on the topic of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and that intensive study actually didn't stop for years and years and years. And of course, I still read stuff and yeah. I read especially science fiction on the future now too. And, and I think it's fair to say that when you look at all the writings on the future, there, it's a, uh, I don't know, want to say controversial. Nobody <coughs> doubts that there is going to be a future, but there, there are controversies as to what is the desirable future or what yes. is the likely future. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the books I've written on the future is Contemporary Futures Thought. Mm -hmm. And in Contemporary Futures Thought, I put together a um, list um, that I broke down into a number of different categories on different theories and paradigms of the future. Uh, theories and paradigms both which have different predictions about mm -hmm. the future and identify different desirable or yeah. preferable futures. And for, for the benefit of our viewers, let's just point out what is the distinction between a theory and a paradigm? A theory is an abstract formulation which provides a way to explain and describe some domain of reality. A paradigm includes a theory, but also includes all the ways of life and all the values and all the activities mm -hmm. that are um, uh, a re that revolve around the theory. Mm -hmm. So a paradigm is more like a informed way of life with an abstract theory at the mm -hmm. center. So the, the paradigm may be, to some extent, even unconscious. Paradigms can be unconscious. At least parts of them can be unconscious, yeah. for sure. In fact, the better you learn a paradigm, the more it becomes unconscious and natural. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. It becomes tacit. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's fair to say that the earliest thinking about the future goes back to at least the earliest human history. Of course, yes. In fact, uh, in my other book, The Evolution of Future Consciousness, where I trace out the development of thinking on the future, I begin with ancient myths mm -hmm. and uh, uh, traditional classical religions, yep. although we associate most of them with um, uh, stories about the origin of the universe. They all also contain uh, narratives and stories about where things are heading with mm -hmm. humankind, the earth, and the universe into the future. So theories about the future go all the way back to uh, uh, Zoroaster and the Babylonians, 
um, and the uh, Chinese, uh, and in fact, uh, clearly in Hinduism, mm -hmm. we have a very elaborate way of thinking about past, present, and future, which extends um, what uh, trillions of years, both yeah. into the past and into the future. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I guess. Uh, if I understand the Hindu theory correctly, it's sort of like we once lived in a golden age and it's been on the decline ever since. Uh, that's a theory that pops up in the West too, mm -hmm. but uh, what I was referring to when I was thinking of Hinduism, I was referring to in a sense the dance of Shiva. Uh -huh. And the dance of Shiva involves creation and then the perpetuation of existence, and then destruction, mm -hmm. and then starting the whole process over again. And even though I'm not an expert in Hinduism, I think the time frame for each cycle of creation and destruction is some colossally huge number of yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the topic of the future mm -hmm. is a topic that has uh, fascinated uh, people since, in fact, the beginnings of recorded history, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as we discussed in an earlier interview, there are pri two primary approaches, I suppose. One being that the, the time is static, society is static, we, things are going to pretty much be the same in the future as they are now, as opposed to things will be very different. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, the first category I use when I talk about theories and paradigms of the future has to do with different approaches to uh, time and change. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one approach is going to be the cyclic approach <laughs> that things just keep repeating themselves over and over again. Another approach is going to be a progressive evolutionary linear approach where there is motion forward. Mm -hmm. uh, one can have a, a static creationism uh, view, which is tomorrow will be the same as today without necessarily even being a cyclic model. Yeah. We also have the view that sooner or later time will come to an end mm -hmm. and that will be it. Boom. Yeah. Uh, and then we have very different variations on those too. So uh, there's different general models of how one conceptualizes time and stability and change and cycles and whether or not it's uphill mm -hmm. or downhill. Mm -hmm. The golden age theory was that, uh, the golden age theory implied that time is downhill, that mm -hmm. it is a fall. Yep. Uh, uh, the uh, progressive or evolutionary theories in, uh, imply that time is uphill. Mm -hmm. Other ones imply that time is chaotic and it goes nowhere fast. Mm -hmm. uh, now forget about the fast, it goes nowhere. <laughs> yes. Well. Uh, of course, religions have all had something to say about the future, and many great religious leaders are known as prophets, yes. which implies that they have a, a vision of yes, the future. Yes, of course, yes. In fact, there were plenty of visions of the future mm -hmm. um, associated with different uh, uh, religious traditions. Uh, more broadly, uh, both in the past and into the present, there have been various uh, predictions made mm -hmm. about where the future is going. Mm -hmm. There's the opposite view that the future is uncertain yeah. and that one can't make very good predictions about the future. And in fact, the further out you look, the less uh, certain you can be about your predictions. Mm -hmm. But clearly throughout history, there's been plenty of visions, there's been plenty of ways in which people predict. People apply all different types of methods to uh, attempting to ascertain uh, what is going to come tomorrow and how certain or uncertain yeah. can we be of it, even to the point of saying, for example, there's a whole array of possibilities and these are what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking of um, Isaac Asimov's yes. Foundation Trilogy, yes. in which he postulates a, yeah, a character who has an uncanny knowledge of the distant future. Yes, uh, his um, uh, uh, central character uh, develops what he calls psychohistory. Right. And psychohistory is using uh, social <clears throat> statistics to make long-range predictions yeah. of the future. Mm -hmm. You can't, in the model, uh, predict individual futures, but you can predict collective futures. Yeah. And uh, that model serves as a basis for the narrative that takes place in the Foundation uh, series by Isaac Asimov. But something goes wrong. Yeah. 
something goes wrong. That is, there is a unexpected, unique occurrence that upsets the apple cart, mm -hmm. the mule, mm -hmm. who is one of the great uh, villains or negative characters in science fiction and disrupts the whole expected flow of events. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you could make statistical predictions. Um, there is a book called The Five Ages of the Universe uh, by physicists Adams and Lachlan who uh, uh, have the audacity to predict the future of the universe to Google years out in time. Mm. That's 10 raised to the power of 100 yeah. times. Yeah. And they think you can make some reliable predictions that far out. That's like almost <laughs> infinite. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, if you write that out as a number, <laughs> it will go from here all the way down there. Google yeah. years, uh -huh. yes. Um, but they think that based on the laws of physics, you can make certain predictions that far out. Well, well, sure. I, I, I know that uh, among cosmologists, the notion of the heat death of the universe yes. is kind of popular. Yes, that, that has been mm -hmm. very popular, and that does have an ultimate prediction to it, which is, in fact, that all of the structure and heterogeneous uh, uh, energetic relationships will break down, will dissipate into total homogeneity mm -hmm. sometime in the distant future. And that, of course, is a prediction of the distant future as well. Uh, but you can get into predictions of uh, human society, mm -hmm. of, the, of the Earth, uh, there is a, a relatively confident prediction that uh, the sun will um, uh, go into a different stage once it burns up a sufficient amount of its hydrogen mm -hmm. about five billion years in the future. And mm -hmm. that's a general prediction. Yep. Uh, indeed, humans make predictions about the future, anticipate the future all the time, mm -hmm. short term, medium term, long term. And sometimes they're right, but uh, sometimes they're wrong, but a lot of times they're right. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if we couldn't anticipate the future with some degree of reliability, we would be very dysfunctional. And in fact, that's one of our great strengths that we can anticipate out, even with elements of uncertainty thrown in, what will occur uh, in the short-term, medium-term, long-term future. And we keep trying to get better at it. Mm -hmm. But there's, of course, competing views and yeah. competing theories. Yeah. Well, our consciousness which is, I know, a big interest of yes. yours, human consciousness seems to always be reaching into the future. Yes, yes. In fact, I would say that mm -hmm. human consciousness is never of the pure present. Mm -hmm. It's always informed by memories of the past and anticipations of what is to come. In fact, if one looks at the nature of how the nervous system works, the nervous system, in fact, works by by accumulating memories that provide a framework in which to interpret what is happening around us and anticipating what is to come. Because nature uh, is not total chaos or willy-nilly this and that, but there are patterns in nature. And based on the patterns we observe in nature as we learn them, we have a uh, a set of concepts and principles for anticipating. So, for example, we all anticipate that the day will last a certain period of time and the sun will set and then there will be night and the next day will come and we anticipate yeah. the seasons and uh, lots of different uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 patterns within nature. Well, you are a professional futurist. You are a member of several societies that yes. study the future. Right. You help create the Department of Future Studies <clears throat> at uh, Rio Salada College. Yes, yes. Where, where you right. taught. And uh, so uh, the intriguing thing to me is that f futurism or future studies is a, mm -hmm. a well-established discipline, although like parapsychology, it's a bit on the margins of our society. Yeah. It's, it's not as if every college has a future studies department. No. In fact, there are very few future <laughs> studies departments, but I would say two things. I would say, number one, everybody is a futurist, mm -hmm. no matter what discipline they're in and no matter what aspect of life they're being concerned with, and that we all think about the future and we all try to 
to various degrees improve our ability to predict, anticipate, and control the future. Uh, so if you went into a uh, department like um, uh, something in technology mm -hmm. or economics or political science, you will find discussions about the future embedded in those departments. Yeah. So whether we're talking about everyday life or we're talking about uh, formal academic disciplines, everybody in one way or another gets involved in thinking about the future and making predictions mm -hmm and identifying goals. Mm -hmm. All companies make predict, uh, both make predictions and set goals for the future. Sure. Yeah, so uh, in fact, it is a fundamental core capacity that we have to both anticipate the future and to attempt to guide it. And in that sense, we're all futurists. And in that sense, almost every academic department talks about the future in one form mm -hmm. or another. But there are very few future studies departments yeah. per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess the the question of the extent to which it's possible to predict the future yes. is is a controversial question. Yes, it is. Some For people. Sure. I mean, when we talk about the Hebrew prophets as one yes. example, my sense is they weren't <clears throat> so much predicting the future as saying, if you don't change your ways, something terrible is about to happen. Yeah, and in future studies, that's called. Um, uh, warnings, mm -hmm. or it's called, uh, uh, there's another expression here, presumptively true statements. Mm. So, for example, mm -hmm. if we keep doing this, this will happen as a consequence, which yeah. is not too good. Right. Now, it's set up as a warning, presumably, to motivate people not to keep doing this so that won't happen in the future, right. that negative consequence. Yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, f a futurist will present lots of uh, uh, situations in which they will uh, de describe negative trends and the negative trends need to be reversed or changed or else we're going to get into more and more trouble in this or that another mm -hmm. direction, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and um, they could say things of the nature of there's a high probability that this kind of thing will happen. Uh, we could always have flukes. We could always have unanticipated wild cards mm -hmm. that come in out of the blue, which will upset our visions, uh, our predictions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the uh, idea of uh, creating futurist warnings that goes all the way back to the prophets is something that futurists, in fact, lots of people still do today. Sure. Yeah. Standard part of politics. Yes, it is. Right. As, yes. As a matter of fact. Now, another way of thinking about the future would be the black swans. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's is it Nassim Taleb who, who yeah. wrote the book the, yeah. the Black Swan, and he's basically saying that in in a, a bell curve of uh, <clears throat> events mm -hmm. uh, that we need to pay more attention to the tails. The tails of yes. the curve could be much larger than we think. Yeah, yeah. There is the argument uh, that um, it is general statistical forces that determine the flow of events. Mm -hmm. Then there is the argument that it is unique events or unique personhoods mm -hmm. that have big effects, yeah. okay? And um, uh, I think any reasonable person needs to incorporate both of those mm -hmm. ideas into when they think about the future. There's general waves, general flows, but there are lots of flukes. There are lots of ends of the bell curve that can impact or appear to impact significantly the flow of events. That's why people will say that it becomes a real challenge mm -hmm. to make uh, uh, predictions of uh, the future because of the uh, unanticipated and odd occurrences that we just yeah. uh, uh, are not uh, in a position to um, uh, think about uh, or understand even. I think one futurist yeah. said the, the one thing we can be absolutely certain of is surprise. Yes, I said that. Well, I don't yeah. know, maybe you read that to somebody else too. Yeah. Somebody else said that too. In fact, when people ask me that question about predicting the future, that's the first thing I will always say. I mm -hmm. predict that the future will surprise us. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that seems to me to be a given, especially if we were to look at how different eras have predicted what would happen in the future. Mm -hmm. And even though they may get some things right, some things they totally miss. So there's a line which is, the future isn't what it used to be, 
but there's a tag on to it, which really hits the nail on the head, and it never was. <laughs> uh, so each era has its vision of the future, yeah. and that vision of the future, to some degree, may hit the nail on the head, and mm -hmm. some degree may not. H.G. Yeah. Wells predicted the atomic bomb in around uh, 1915, uh, mm -hmm. or 13. Mm -hmm. uh, in The World Set Free, mm -hmm. one of his science fiction novels. But his understanding of the atomic bomb was that it would explode slowly and continuously and ripple out as a nuclear reaction mm. as opposed to one big whammo, I which see. is the way it eventually yeah. was designed. But he did get the idea of an atomic bomb, so he mm -hmm. got it partially right. Well, and, and many science fiction writers have been uncanny in their descriptions. Yes, yes. Um, and science fiction writers will often say, like futurists will often say, that we're not in the business of predicting the future. Mm -hmm. But in fact, in both cases, that's not true. Yeah. That is, futurists will give you the most probable scenarios, but they'll give you a set and they'll say, it's probably going to go this way, this way, this way, or that way. Well, it's not exact prediction, but it's still mm -hmm. probabilistic prediction. Science fiction writers will attempt to create realistic scenarios yeah. of the future. And uh, not that they just write about the future, but they do write a lot about the future. And in those realistic scenarios, they will uh, invent ideas that are extrapolations of things that are happening today. So even though they may be attempting to create an engaging story, they are also attempting to create something which may seem realistically plausible for 50 or 100 or more years in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so they're involved in prediction too, even mm -hmm. if it's not their only thing that they're involved in. Well, I've spent actually many years involved in financial forecasting. Yes, right, and, yes. Uh, that's an intriguing area because the forecasts themselves change <clears throat> the future. If, if, yes. I, if I develop a method uh, and I can say, well, for the last 10 years, here's a pattern that's held yes. in the stock market, we can use it to make predictions. Well, as soon as a sufficient number of people agree with me and start using it, the the pattern changes. <clears throat> yes. Say, yeah, and in fact, one thing that's going to affect the future is going to be our anticipations of the future. Mm -hmm. And that enters into the equation and continues to enter into the equation yeah. because we are future conscious beings who use our ideas about the future to guide the future. And we communicate those ideas to other people who may or may not disagree with them. And so sometimes our predictions actually cause a counter reaction where it goes a different direction because we said that we thought it was going to go this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it's almost like we're involved in a time travel scenario where I go ahead into the future, see what it would be like, tell people today what it's going to be like, yeah. and that impacts today such that the future I went to go see no longer materializes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... As I tell people uh, when I ever have taught my intro course on the future, the future is the only game in town, realistically speaking. And it's a highly practical uh, issue to have to study mm -hmm. because all of our goals, all of our dreams, all of our plans, all of the things that we think about and we attempt to uh, engage with to realize the good life have to do with the future. So the future is definitely very, very practical and very, very important to try to understand and work with as best as we can mm -hmm. because that's what we're going to spend the rest of our lives. And, and it seems to me that, you know, fundamental to being human is the idea of planning and yes. setting goals. Yes, and it is. Working it's fundamental. towards those goals. Yes, if you took away... Um, <clears throat> the capacity for future consciousness, we would be like vegetables. Mm -hmm. We would not, strictly speaking, be human. And in fact, we are continuously guiding our behavior based on our goals, our plans. We may have to make continuous adjustments. We may at times try to go with the flow a little bit, or maybe sometimes even more so. But there's a sense in which 
we are future directional, future oriented, and we are constantly moving into and guiding that future ahead of us. And so that's why it's so critical both in understanding what humans are mm -hmm. and also critical in terms of its uh, practical relevance uh, to uh, our lives. And that's part of the reason why I began to develop courses on it was because I saw it uh, as practical as well as mind expansive, mm -hmm. which is the other side of the yeah. coin. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely the future is integral to us and the future is of great significance and practical value to everybody. Well, we live in an era of, I think it's fair to say, exploding technology. Yes. In fact, multiple exploding right. technologies. And for the most part, it's, it's very hard for people to anticipate how these, all these new technologies from artificial intelligence yes. to nanotechnology to yeah. biotechnology, how are they going to interact with each other? Yeah, and people try to figure that out, and they're mm -hmm. continuously trying to figure that out. <clears throat> it may be a sad and bitter truth, but the universe in which we exist, I mean the human universe, yeah. our reality, seems to be getting more complicated and more complicated, mm -hmm. and also the pace of change seems to be accelerating. Yeah. And so in order to be able to um, cope, flourish, thrive, guide this reality, this calls for an evolution in us mm -hmm. because we're in a type of reality which is more complex and more fast-paced than the reality of 100, 200, 300 years ago. It's been building. It didn't happen in the last mm -hmm. 20 years, but we're definitely moving faster and, and faster. And the irony is that uh, in evolutionary terms, our nervous system itself evolved probably o over a, a period of uh, hundreds of thousands yes. of years, but we're basically the same physiological beings that we were 40, 50,000 years ago. Yeah, and I've heard that argument. Actually, I've also heard the argument that we are changing uh -huh. biologically. Yeah. One argument, for example, is that we are uh, uh, being naturally selected mm -hmm. for being urbanized beings, mm. and that urbanization has been around sufficiently long that it's actually having an impact on our biological evolution. Uh, now, that isn't to say that the human of 40 to 50,000 years ago fundamentally wasn't the same as the biological mm -hmm. human today. Uh, but uh, we are the architects of creating this increasing rush. Yeah. And therefore, we're going to need to be the architects of modifying and evolving ourselves to be able to flourish in the rush that we have created. Now, some people might say we need to go back to a simpler way of life, mm -hmm. that this is not good, but this is a trajectory that's a consequence of certain fundamental features of being human, and uh, it's, a, um, uh, it's a deep and probably unavoidable challenge that we're going to need to amplify our own capacities to be able to thrive in that kind of reality. And that's going to mean some biological modification, among other things. But, but the most important thing that you emphasize is that we need to cultivate an, a, a, a wisdom right. that's commensurate with yes. the powerful technologies yes, we do. We that do. we have. Yes, we do. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the central thing mm -hmm. that we should shoot for is the enhancement of wisdom and that is a holistic character virtue involving a set of different strengths that we integrate together in order to um, intelligently and creatively produce the best possible results for both ourselves and for others and for the world around us. And includes uh, uh, qualities uh, from um, uh, informed optimism, a capacity for hope, for example, oh, and courage, for example, um, 
change generates fear. Uncertainty generates fear. We need to have uh, realistic courage at a higher level to be able to contend with change and with uncertainty. We need self-responsibility. We need a lot more self-responsibility deep within ourselves. A wise person takes responsibility for their own life. And right now we have people who feel overpowered and out of control and don't feel responsible for their own futures. Mm -hmm. And that's disempowering and depressing. Those are different features of, yeah. of wisdom. So wisdom as a general character virtue, as a power of the mind, is something we need to cultivate a lot greater in order to more successfully and proactively uh, thrive and flourish in the mm -hmm. future. Well, that's been the goal of philosophy since the days of Socrates. Yes, it's been even before Socrates. Yeah. Confucius was into wisdom, too. Yeah. Um, yes, and in fact, the tradition of wisdom has a long, long history to it. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest, and there was recent research on wisdom as well, there's in fact a wisdom renaissance, but I would suggest is that we need a concept of wisdom that is, uh, has contemporary relevance, incorporates the concept of evolution into it mm -hmm. in a dynamic reality, and is future focused. And wisdom, it turns out, is a human ideal. Mm -hmm. And just like human knowledge or the good are human ideals. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we work on further articulating what we mean by it, what's needed within it, and how do you realize it? Yeah. So it's something that is, uh, it's a goal to shoot for that we're creating ourselves, the, the very uh -huh. goal. It, it seems to me, at least in theory, yeah. possible, maybe even likely, that wisdom would imply saying no to some technological possibilities that are very real. like. New bombs, or oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In new fact, new right. forms of uh, genetic engineering, uh, and yet I'm under the impression that society is is rushing headlong. <clears throat> and even though maybe in some countries that are highly religious, the Christian values of some societies will say, well, for example, no stem cell research. In another culture, they don't have that value. It's mm -hmm. going to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we have to consider what is going to be beneficial to human well-being, both for ourselves, for others, mm -hmm. and the world at large. Yep. And in that context of what is the good, as best as we understand it at that point in time, we need to make decisions about how to guide the evolution of our technology. It seems to me that when you use the word rush, I see technological evolution significantly driven by the desire to make money. Mm. And so we continually attempt to sell mm -hmm. new gadgets for purposes of making the buck. Right. And um, I'm not even just talking about technologies that popular culture uses. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about technologies that uh, develop in the military as mm -hmm. well. Yep. And so anything that can reap a profit, <clears throat> let's do it, yep. but is profit a pivotal, central, bottom line value with respect to what is human well-being? Mm -hmm. Should that be our fundamental value? Um, and uh, my answer would be no. So we will invent technologies that may have a negative impact on human well-being, mm -hmm. but we invent them and we market them because we can make money off of them. R right, and, and you know, uh, all the scholars in every ac academic community in the world may say, yeah, this is immoral, but, uh, the they're not the decision makers necessarily. No, they're Sco not the scholars decision makers. Tend not to be no, they're not the makers. decision makers. Yes, <clears throat> I mean, for example, I do not take the view that genetically modifying either 
our foodstuffs or genetically creating our foodstuffs or genetically modifying humans or animals mm -hmm. is immoral. I think that it can be something very positive and good. So it's not like I would say, don't do those kinds of things mm -hmm. because they may be beneficial. Yep. But there may be other things which turn out not to be so beneficial. And um, uh, what I like to say, or like to bring up, and it's not simply my own idea, but I bring it up anyway, is that with smartphones, we are attempting to outsource our memory. Mm -hmm. And this is not a good thing mm -hmm. because memory it, it, a really good functional memory is an active integrative process that the human mind participates in creating. Mm -hmm. When I start to try to put my memory out there, mm -hmm. I'm putting it out there simply as numbers and facts without any understanding to it mm -hmm. because it's not up here. Right. So I'm diminishing my very capacity to think in an informed fashion utilizing what I have learned because I don't need to learn as much because I could just go look it up. Mm -hmm. So this is a negative consequence, psychological, and it's a negative consequence that's psychological that may be just as severe as developing a new form of atomic weaponry mm -hmm. because what we're doing is we're creating uh, possibly, possibly, imbeciles in the process. In, in other words, you're saying that there is a sense in which technology is responsible for the dumbing down of the population. It could be in ways. It could be. But it mm -hmm. could also be used to smarten the population, yep. too. That's where you have to think about what are going to be the consequences mm -hmm. of your inventions. Mm -hmm. And this is where you get into the future of technology. Yep. And science fiction gets into it, too, where let's take this technology and let's extrapolate out. Is this going to have a positive effect or is this going to have a negative mm -hmm. effect on future humans and future human society? And then to thoughtfully make decisions about which ones to pursue and which ones not to pursue. And this is not trying to be authoritarian or dictatorial. This is simply trying to use good sense and wisdom in determining what kinds of inventions we are going to go after and what kinds of inventions are we not going to go after mm -hmm. because they're not going to do us any good yeah. or they're going to hurt us. Well, of course, we don't have a uh, world society or a world government. So it's likely that uh, given the multiplicity of uh, laws and nations uh, that uh, almost every good development will be developed somewhere and every bad development will end up being developed somewhere if people think they can make a profit. And yes. the consequence of that might be a, a return to a caste system. Yes, there could be lots of different things. In fact, when you started that, you brought up a couple of really interesting points, one of them being that the future is a contentious area. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different people and groups with different theories yep. and different vested interests mm -hmm. and different agendas. Yes, some and they, people say we must be ecological. Yes. And other people say, no, we must you yes. know, drill, baby, drill. Yes, exactly. So. We, we don't have this uniformed agreement mm -hmm. as to what the right way to go in the future is. In yeah. fact, we fight over it. Right. In fact, I would say that every major war throughout human history has been a war over the future, mm -hmm. over whose desirable future was going to rule. Yeah. Okay, so we have this contention and we have this competition going on. And so it becomes important that we attempt to evolve ourselves psychologically and ethically uh, such that collectively we can make better decisions, more wise decisions as to what to pursue. Because, of course, you could take any technology and you could turn it into something uh, destructive or entirely self-serving. Mm -hmm. But what if we work on the psychology of this and ask, how can we facilitate the evolution of humans who are less self-serving, yeah. who are less destructive? So then there won't be as much of an inclination to make those kinds of things or market those mm -hmm. kinds of things just to either uh, gain more power 
or to make more money? Well, you know, back in the day, um, I was a graduate student in criminology. Okay. I have a master's degree in criminology, yes. amongst other things. Yes. And uh, at that time, there was uh, a, an important concept in the air, social engineering. Yes. How can we engineer society yes. to eliminate crime? Right, right. And, and many professors had ideas. Yes. We, we need to do this. We yes. need to do that. We have to yes. think about justice yes. first. If yes. we had a just society, there would be less crime. Yes. And so let's engineer the society yes. for justice. Yes. But the, the problem was, of course, at the end of the day, these professors had no power. In spite, maybe they had some really good ideas, but they uh, really, in, in the hierarchy of power, university professors are, well, maybe they're in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Interesting point, because I think humans from the beginnings of civilization mm -hmm. have been involved in social engineering, yeah. in that there have been individuals who have had values, who have had purposes and goals, who would orchestrate and influence the evolution of their tribes, their cities, their government, their law. And so social engineering, that is the purposeful uh, um, uh, creation of societies is a longstanding aspect mm -hmm. of purposeful evolution in humans. Yeah. Okay. Now, college professors throughout history may not have, generally speaking, had a big impact, but individuals in that cluster have had a big impact. Hmm. So, for better or worse, we have uh, uh, Karl Marx, we have Thomas Jefferson, now, we have, um, uh, let's see, H.G. Um, uh, Wells, we have uh, Condorcet and other, uh, 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 Voltaire, other um, intellectuals or professorial types mm -hmm. or thinkers and writers mm -hmm. who have presented new ideals for human yes. society, right. which have... Uh, uh, trickled down and had big impacts on uh, the general population. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, uh, individuals and thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, even if they weren't college professors, definitely have impact. I mean, occasionally, they can break through. And, yes, yeah. and they do, you yeah. know, and there are loud voices and people who do lead the charge for whatever it's worth. Uh, and some of them are intellectual or intellectual like. And people keep trying things out. Yep. There continues to be experimentations in different kinds mm -hmm. of societies. Uh, so I don't think we have any way around the challenge of social engineering mm -hmm. because I think we have engaged in it right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it well? And that, of course, means doing it in a way that is not going to be oppressive and destroy the individual. Mm -hmm. So like one definition I give of the ideal society would be a society which was able to support the maximization of individual individuality in all of its people. Mm -hmm. uh, not to run against individuality and individual expression, but actually to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we keep working on trying to figure out, and people keep trying to figure out and work on different experimentations of it, what would be that better human society. And that's part of future studies, yep. in fact. That's utopian that, thinking. That's really your main focus. That's one focus, yeah. yes. That's one focus, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, actually, I have taught courses on all areas of the future mm -hmm. because the future lends itself to any particular domain of uh, human existence, from yeah. technology to society to the mind, the future religion. I think you pointed yeah. out that it, it's really an integrative topic. It is. It's an integrative topic. Yes, yeah. it is. And, and utopian thinking down through history has been one area of uh, futurist uh, thought. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even though people would say that Plato in his Republic was not envisioning an ideal future society, uh, he does set up an ideal. 
and he says, this is how a society should run. Mm -hmm. And even if he doesn't place it in the future, he presents humans with an ideal mm -hmm. that they can contemplate and think about and consider whether or not this is something that could be realized mm -hmm. in human affairs. Mm -hmm. That's something of a benchmark. Perhaps. Yeah, it is. Yeah. A benchmark that got criticized a lot, by the yeah. way. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, yeah. Well, Tom Lombardo, I know we could talk about the future forever. Yes, good. <laughs> and, and we plan Until to... Until the infinite future. We yes. plan to have more conversations. Yes. And, uh, so we'll, we'll be digging into this again. But okay. for now, thank you so much for thank being you, with Jeff. me. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, okay. And thank you for being with us.